у меня душа болит, потому что страшно дивиться сейчас. Люди там днювали и ночували, пешки ходили, садили цей лес. А сейчас кто с него пал? Изначально там начали фигурировать люди того же Торбина, а потом сразу, сразу переменилась риторика на то, что виноваты лесники. Через своих знакомых поведомил правоохранительные органы про то, что заехала группа, а на, але нам ответ надали, что это самооборона. Четыре машины уехала по выписке, четыре машины возвращаются, забирают лес уже не учтенку и по этой же выписке едет дальше. А ты смотри вот это, я еще раз говорю, разобью, у меня ничего не будет. То есть они поставили лесников в зависимости от себя. Вы знаете, что я был первым, кто боролся за сбережение леса. Что до пана Рощука, то следствие было действием. Певными фактами и доказами, которые свидетельствуют про его ймовірну коррумпованную деятельность, также связанную и с подпалами леса. Мой конный клуб, да, все знают мой конный клуб, он находится как раз недалеко от места пожара. Как это возможно, чтобы правоохранительные органы, которые находятся безпосередньо в лесу, этого не видели? Это была поширена проблема, Катя про нее говорила. Люди с ней безопасно, и я. Вот именно за те машины она и была убита. Тут лес. Я хочу, чтобы просто, ну, действительно, замовников Катерины нашли, чтобы нарешті сняли той баннер, который висит на подъеме. This road leads to Oleshki Forest in Ukraine's Kherson region, nearly 590 kilometers south of Kiev. The same forest the late advisor to the Kherson mayor, Katrina Hanzyuk, was outspoken about. A fire in the spring of 2018 had destroyed over 600 hectares of this forest. Hanzyuk stated the forest was set on fire so that its trees could be sold. In July of 2018, Katarina Hanzyuk was attacked with acid. Four months later, in November, she died as a result of the injuries sustained. The prosecution stated that the activist's position on the forest fire was likely the reason she suffered the attack. The Hanzyuk case has already been going on for six months. Currently, eight people are featured. They include members of a volunteer battalion, former law enforcers and officials. This question of who ordered the murder of Hanzyuk has become one of the most popular ones to address to the law enforcement agencies and the Government. But what's happening with the Oleshki forest today? The logs are still being driven out illegally. We came to see where they've been taken, which laws are being broken, and who's gaining from these processes. It's afternoon. We're near the Radensk Forestry Enterprise, located by the Oleshki Forest in the village of Radensk. The driver of one of the trucks shows us special marks on each of the logs. He says that everything's being counted and documented. Here's the note on the logs. Everything's legal. Here's the receipt. Viktor Tyshenko, the head of Kherson region's forestry, says that the trees are being felled legally and the process is thoroughly monitored. The inspection and control are carried out by the respective bodies, the management team of the forest, the ecology inspectors, as well as the prosecutor's office, the police and everyone else. There's more people monitoring it than working in there. It's evening now. We head into the forest. The deeper we go into it, the fewer trees we see and the more felled wood. We move into the direction of the chainsaw noise. There's a civilian car full of wood. The man next to it introduces himself as security guard and threatens to break our camera. The next morning we try to determine where the wood is being taken. We see a vehicle moving towards a greenhouse. The trees have no marks on them, just like the ones we saw taken to the Koftuni village. Setting forests on fire is just one of the steps in the illegal logging scheme. The burned trees need to be chopped down but can still be sold. Metro Dinovsky, also known as Dim, explains to us how this scheme works. He was working with Hanzyuk in fighting illegal deforestation. They make a document and then four cars drive out using this document, but four cars come back, taking away the unmarked wood using the same note and receiving money for the wood they bring. 
So what happens is, on paper, they mention 350 cubic meters. The car drives in, they chop down the forest, and the forestry receives $40. The car takes five cubic meters worth of trees and takes them to different places to sell. The remaining 350 cubic meters, the ones that weren't declared, for them they receive cash, and that they, the forestry manager and the proprietor, divide amongst themselves. Our sources within law enforcement tell us that all illegal logging in the Oleshki forest was previously controlled by businessman Serhii Braha, who, according to prosecution, was present during the gatherings of the suspects in Hazuk's murder, where they discussed ways of inflicting harm on the activist. These days, the scheme of setting fire, then driving the trees away for sale, is used by her son businessman, Mikola Urmanov, a close friend of the family of Oleksiy Levin Moskalenko, another suspect in Hansuk murder. Clearly, Urmanov was one driving the wood away. I had a couple of conflicts with him. The last ended with us stopping two or three vehicles full of wood. Members of our organization managed to capture three or two vehicles holding illegally harvested wood. Urmano himself tells us that he's never been involved in illegal logging and selling forests. He's not used this so-called scheme, he says, and denies knowing Levin at all, but then adds that no, he's actually asked Levin's help in certain situations before. I prepare wood, so I, according to the contract, one person chops the tree down, then somebody documents the fact of it being taken down, puts the data into a computer, and only after people come to us. So that's when we take the woods to society. However, as we've been told by the Kherson Regional Forestry Management, Urmanu previously worked in other forests near the city of Dnipro. Later, he signed a contract to work at the Radensk Forestry, where he still works after the May 2018 fire. The Oleshki Forest was on fire for three whole days. The foresters say that the blaze destroyed one of its best parts. They choose the best area of the forest, a pristine expanse of forest, where the trees were chopped down. There were dry branches lying around. No need for fire starters, just drop a lit match and there you go, a fire. Do you know how easily pine trees burn? We spent the entire day with shovels up until the night basically spent days and nights there. The first four suspects, named in relation to the forest fire, were from the group of Serhii Torbin, who potentially organized Hansuk's murder. They arrived in Oleshki town a couple of weeks prior to the fire. Their phone numbers were identified at the fire scene. The phone numbers of Torbin and those present there with him were identified as being at the crime scene. Despite the law enforcers, I don't want to specify which ones, assuring us that the fire was caused by outdoor grill kits, but we know that it was set on fire in three different places. The head of the Oleshki Regional Council says that he warned the law enforcement about the arrival of a group of armed men to Oleshki. I asked my friends to tell the law enforcement that a group of people had come in and that they're armed. My friends told me that they notified the law enforcers, but were told that it's a self-defense group. So who wanted to make profit from the Oleshki forest? One of the suspects in Hanzuk's murder, Vladislav Manger, has been actively trying to create a park at the place of Oleshke, Hola Pristin, and Novakahovka Forest, which would be funded by the regional council. Local activists assert that this park would have helped the local authorities monopolize illegal logging in the area. The forest trees would then be removed and an alley placed as a park manager. The staff would consist of cleaners, fellers, basically people maintaining order and issuing quotas for forest felling. The foresters opposed the creation of such a park. Vladislav Manger established a moratorium on tree felling in 2016, making it impossible for foresters to make money by carrying out sanitary felling. They managed to pass this moratorium on tree felling and in so basically forced the foresters to become dependent on them. The foresters tried to appeal this decision in court. There was some behind-the-scene negotiation going on, that's for sure. 
it was clear that they managed to make a pact with the foresters on their own terms. The work of the Hilea Park was supposed to be monitored by the Nobody But Us organization, the activists tell us. One of its representatives, Oleksandr Kovalev, according to the official investigation, helped the notorious Berkut riot police officers flee Ukraine after Euromaidan in spring 2014. Even the business people who we arrested and transferred to the police in the six months that we were guarding the forest, they themselves stated that nobody but us organization had arrived there. And I'll repeat that this organization is run by Stavitsky and based in the territory seized and stolen by Levin Moskalenko in 2017. Vladimir Arnaut, one of the founders of the Novakohovka-based Nobody But Us organization, says they never received any offices from Levin and they only cooperated with the regional council when they collected humanitarian aid for the war zone in Donbass, while Vladislav Munger claims they were just fighting for forest preservation. We've done so much to stop it. We passed the moratorium. Foresters tried suing us. We took decisions regarding all types of felling and even wood lines. We've done all that. After that, we created the Hilea Park in order to change responsibility regarding felling from administrative to criminal. Hansiuk wrote on social media that nothing would have gone through without the approval of head of the regional state administration, Andrei Hordeyev. But Hordeyev tells us he had no influence over the Oleshki forest decisions. Let's think clearly. Who out of the officials has influenced in the deforestation business? Before 2016, it was the natural res reservation department of any regional state administration that would be approving the felling schemes. That's before 2016. From 2016 onwards, these schemes are not approved by regional administrations or its departments, despite some activists asking for that. Ask them to read the laws. The emblazed area of the Oleshki forest is located near the Ayodin lakes. The activists tell us that this area has long been of interest to the deputy governor of the region, Yvhen Rishuk. The 600 hectares of this forest burnt down where? Near the healing Ayodin lakes. It's no secret that these lakes have been of interest to the deputy governor, Yevan Rashchuk. He's been longing to seize these coveted lakes, to create recreational facilities there. Because he has an equestrian club just nearby in the Oleshki region called Grand Prix. According to our information, Ukraine's security service has carried out searches at dozens of wood preparation facilities located in the Oleshke and Holopristin regions. In the Solonsev village, they found around 3,000 cubic meters of stolen wood. And these 3,000 cubic meters were found in the wood preparation facility that belongs either directly or indirectly to the deputy governor and head of the Solonsky village council. Ukraine's prosecutor general, Yuri Lutsenko, also stated that Rishuk could have had something to do with the forest fire. However, Rishuk himself, who has been suspended of his duties, denies this. My equestrian club, everyone knows my equestrian club, you visit it yourself yesterday, is located just near the emblazed area. When I told the deputy manager of Herson Regional Forestry, he said, didn't you know that the fire was moving in your direction? We haven't changed anything here. All Katerina's possessions are still in their place. These were her two favorite posters. This one was from a rally in 2017. The only thing that has changed here is Katerina's presence has been replaced by a portrait with a black ribbon. This was her workplace. You can tell a lot about Katerina from it. Some souvenirs, gifts, various little things that she loved. Some of them she received as gifts, some she brought from her trips, like this one from Mariupol. This was her last journey and for the first time she drove herself, so she bought this souvenir as a memento. This was a week before the attack. She ran a conference there. 
There's almost no forest left there. It was a small human-made forest. If you burn it, it'll turn into a desert. It was a big problem that Katerina spoke about it in order to draw attention. And these people now say, well, she had no influence, she wasn't important. She did hold certain power and her opinion was respected. She was known as a blogger and an activist. She had many followers. And when she wrote about things like that, this problem finally started being talked about. Katerina Hansiuk's murder case currently has eight suspects. One of them, Oleksiy Levin Moskalenko, an aide to member of regional council Mikola Slavitsky, and an advisor to Vladislav Munger is on wanted list. Activists from the Who Ordered the Murder of Katerina Hansiuk civic movement say that his fleeing was aided by the head of Kherson police, Artur Merikov. The police refused to give comments, but former police officer Roman Chukalov, who used to, together with activists, stop illegal businesses but was then forced to resign, tells us that there was another person with influence over Merikov. That person was Igor Pavlovsky, who was also featured in the case. Pavlovsky is a former aide to Poroshenko blog MP Mikola Palamarchuk. And so we meet in the car at the backyard of the Palamachuk's constituency office and he tells me the next day they would have a session where I would need to vote, as he tells me, and that's in favour of the declaration of no confidence in the regional council head Pavlo Potoski. To confirm his intentions, he rings Arthur Menikov in my presence saying that Roman Chidakov has agreed He's with us. Tomorrow, the session will take place and everything will be okay. He wants to work with us. Artur Mirko has said that he doesn't want to comment on the case that's been handed over to Ukraine's security service. It is Igor Pavlovsky's testimony that became the basis to the decision to make Vladislav Munger one of the suspects in the case. Munger, however, says that he's seen the regional council had only once in his life. He recalls how once upon a time, a frightened Levin Moskalenko has run to him and said, It was us who ordered the murder of Katerina Hanziuk. Mikolaevich and myself have ordered it. In late February, members of Kherson City Council voted in favor of renaming Luteranska Street into Katerina Hanziuk Street. This is the street with the police headquarters and local department of the security service of Ukraine. Next week, a group of people had turned up to the city council, protesting such a decision. This was also demanded by Vladislav Munger's lawyer, member of local council Dmitro Ilchenko. But this didn't help. Manga himself said, looking into my eyes, that he swears he didn't do it. How can I not trust him? But then, how can I not trust Prosecutor General Yuri Lutsenko when he says that there are grounds to accuse Magna? You know, I don't want to trust anyone. All I want is to identify the murderers of Katrina and so that we can finally take the banner off our building. <laughs>